Welcome to another edition of Throwing Down Heavy Light. My name is Al Jamal Binding. I'm the chair of the board of Movement on Multiple Race Equity, which deals with anti-racism, white supremacy, and issues of diversity, and helping us to bring our worlds together. Today we have with us is Dr. Laura Rose, who is a re resident assistant uh, professor and interim internship director. She works in the Department of Political Science and International Relations in the College of Arts and Science at Creighton University. She also works in the African Studies Department. We got to know her when she presented some of her, the challenges we face on the continent at a meeting or a community meeting uh, at Creighton some months ago. And also she talks about the link of the struggle of African-Americans in this country related to some of these issues. We talked about that at that conference. I had a chance to read uh, one of her academic papers, Everyday Justice, African Populism, Populism and Caring Traditional Justice in Rwanda, which deals with Rwanda and her visits to that country in 2012 and so on. This study that she did dealt with genocide and how they were dealing with that situation years later. And again, we know this happened between April 7th and of course, April 19th, 1994. And it was over a hundred days and over 80, 800,000 Tutsis were murdered by the Hutsis uh, militias in that time. And again, the United States stood back and did not do much. And Bill Clinton, President Bill Clinton said that was probably one of the worst presidency things that he did not do when he was a president. So Dr. Rose, you can tell a little bit more about yourself, but also welcome throwing down throw some throwing down some heavy light. Can you tell a little bit more with the viewing artists who you are and so on? Yes, um, I'm Laura Roost. And uh, as as Jamal said, I, I am at Creighton. Um, working in the African Studies program and in the Department of Political Science and International Relations. Um, I teach courses on African politics, on international political economy, on um, global poverty and development, um, on uh, uh, international conflict, those sorts of those sorts of topics, um, and the general uh, international politics introduction. So I get to help students dive deeper into the 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 world around them, but I'm also very interested in civic engagement in the classroom and service learning in the classroom, um, and this idea that the local is global, and helping students uh, see the kind of global connections that are here in Omaha for them, um, and also the idea that, you know, these global problems are also happening, like they don't just manifest globally, right? There's there are all kinds of little small things going on. Um, and so they figure out, you know, what they can do where they are um, and kind of move move on from there. Mm -hmm. Now, as I was reading your scholarly paper, or we say academic pay article, I was confused by two concepts. You use the word GACA, I'm not sure how to pronounce it. And it was court, community court case and the International C Criminal <laughs> Tribunal in Rwanda, uh, ICTR. How are they contrast? Kind of like, what does that term mean? And what is significant of understanding those different legal entities? And so uh, if you think, I'll do a little history trip back. Um, when, uh, so 1994, when you have genocide in Rwanda, you also had the first multiracial uh, democratic election in South Africa. And after those, you had the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. So it became this really interesting um, discussion within transitional justice literature at that time. So transitional justice deals with what do we do after there's been mass violence, mass atrocities. Um, and the International Criminal Tribunal model started, started with Nuremberg, but it was uh, resurrected for uh, the former Yugoslavia um, and then for Rwanda, um, this idea of having courts, tribe, people, but these were, they could only deal with the highest level perpetrators, the, the planning level people. Um, that doesn't deal with all the folks on the ground, especially if you think about uh, the Rwandan genocide as being, it's a really weird term, but within genocide studies, we would call it a very effective genocide in terms of being able to kill a lot of people very quickly um, and using uh, uh, even rudimentary, you know, farming tools, that kind of stuff. Um, and so what do you do with all these kind of perpetrators across? Uh, the ICTR didn't deal with that. Um, and international criminal courts couldn't deal with that kind of level. So 
countries like South Africa decided they were going to go with the truth and reconciliation process and try to get people to talk about what happened. Because when you do a court, there's incentive for people not to say what happened, right? Um, so you don't want to have as long of a court sentence, that kind of thing. And so with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission um, in South Africa, people would be given amnesty. And the idea was the truth was more important and letting people know what happened to their family members. Um, and so, uh, you know, prioritize getting the truth out. So it became this idea that, you know, you either pick between are you going to do this retributive trials or are you going to do a truth process and try to get a narrative created? Um, and Rwanda was uh, deeply, they were not, they were not, ex they didn't want to go down the truth and reconciliation path at that time. Um, they had also been hesitant with the ICTR. The Rwandan government was sitting on the UN Security Council at the time the genocide started. So the genocidal government was on the Security Council and so was telling the Security Council, hey, uh, this isn't that big of a deal. You don't have to get get involved too deeply. Um, but then when that government was replaced, they still had their seats. So the new government um, was very much advocating for the International Criminal uh, Tribunal in Rwanda, for Rwanda. But uh, ultimately, that tribunal did not have the death penalty as an option. And the Rwanda government wanted that to be an option. Um, they've since abolished the death penalty. But at that time period, uh, they wanted it to be an option. And so what they did is they resurrected this. Uh, um, it had been a very old custom and practice within Rwanda called gachacha. And so it uh, kind of, yeah, kind of translates to like justice in the grass. You may have seen a book with that title. Mm -hmm. um, if you, if you, if you follow this, but um, the idea, it was originally created for, you know, like my neighbor, my neighbor took my chicken, right? And so everybody in the community comes together in the common area on the hill because there's a lot of hills in Rwanda. Um, and then they try to sort out, okay, how do we how do we get these, how do we figure out what happened and how do we get these neighbors together again? Well, let, me, um, let me interrupt you a second. So there's two levels. One is the international level and one is the grassroots mm -hmm. level. And yes. what I understand that, at some point, they wanted to have justice, and get, which leads a little bit to the other follow-up, like is, I couldn't determine from listening and reading if there was reparations from the government, like we say, give money or justice from the international community, or was it local? In other words, if somebody committed something against somebody's family, how does that help us in sense of dealing with some of these tangible outcomes? Because some of what you're saying Lord, almost sounds academic versus practical. So help 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 us understand that little concept a bit. Kind of these de deconstructive yeah. forces well, for us. Oh, and so this becomes um, some of the criticisms of all the past. Uh, even the even the um, South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission, uh, the one of the fine they did the report at the end, and the one thing that was never implemented and still has not been implemented is the reparations part of it. Um, and you're seeing that pop up in. Uh, contemporary South African politics is that as you're watching the elections uh, that are going on this year in South Africa, um, that's one of, uh, it connects with a lot of contemporary issues. Mm -hmm. um, the idea at the international level with the criminal courts is that the uh, the trials are the justice, right? Oh, so like you do process, try- in other make, words, just the process. Yes, gotcha. yep. And so uh, there has not been, uh, reparations restitution at that level and the and the gachachas as well um uh now if there were if there was you know property of some kind to give back because there was a lot of looting a lot of taking property um try to deal with some of that but uh not not really monetary but now uh, you, you, got, you walk away with something in your hand in other words I'm, I'm no, and, up just and that's Oh, okay, go ahead. Well, I was, go well, that's, and that's one of the things. Um, so, uh, like a lot of these narratives was were very much around, <clears throat> you know, like criminal courts or truth. You know, these things as the justice, right? And one of the things that I had noticed was um, there wasn't a lot of connection with local folks, right? Like, so there was this great story where 
um, this was when I was there in 2009, but uh, the Renzaho reading had been read. And so that case is, was an uh, international criminal tribunal case. And uh, he was responsible for, for some of the massacres at San Famille, which is this Catholic church that is directly across the street from the outreach center for mm -hmm. the ICTR. So to give you another kind of perspective on this, the IC, the court itself was located in Arusha, Tanz Tanzania, not in Rwanda, right? Um, and so if you go to the court, like when I went to the court, the main people in the audience are um, uh, Western researchers and um, a lot of family of accused, um, but not as many like folks from Rwanda because they can't do the trip over. So you'd have this uh, outreach office in in Kigali that would broadcast um, broadcast rulings. So I'd ask them, hey, are you going across the street? Have you let the church know that this is going to be happening? And there was this, there was kind of a, a comment of, you know, well, we put it out everywhere, but a lot of people can't come because they have jobs, they have other things to do. Right. And I was like, but the argument for this is that this is what helps people go on with their lives. And it seems like they're already going on with their lives. So I was interested in what actually, like what is doing that function, right? And it turns out that um, a lot of the work is actually nonprofit organizations, um, other organizations, community groups that are doing um, economic skills training, um, uh, so now we're internal forces was driving something that should have been a little bit more driven internally. Now, one of the things I yes. got from the paper, and, and, and I, I know you spent a considerable amount of time in your paper talking about it, was the issue of gender. And, mm -hmm. and, and you even used uh, Kohlberg and some other psychologist type folks and talked about young girls and so on. And I found that fascinating. But how does that relate to genocide and problems in the African nation when you talk about gender? And I think your gender alluded mm -hmm. to some of the things that happened more so in this country than when you laid out your scenario in the paper. But I think you extrapolated and went over to Africa with some of the mm -hmm. issues that affect people and women there. So help us understand yeah. that link between gender and genocide. Well, and part of it ends up being, uh, you know, if you, if you look for the, you know, for almost 15 years or so, Rwanda has had the highest number of women in parliament in the world. Wow. Um, and part of that is a function of, um, a shortage of men because men tend to be killed outright during the genocide women okay. would be so women. raped um but you'd also have this question when you're talking about the gachachas and that one of those restitution issues because you would also have folks who fled uh during the genocide but they had taken somebody's house right so they had they had been a per perpetrator they took somebody's house uh they stayed out of the country but they're like female family members would come back, like women would come back and occupy those houses. Um, and so then it becomes a, you know, there's somebody living in the house. How do you do that? How do you give the house back? The person living in the house isn't the person who did the killing and yet they're connected. Um, so it's one of those messy, messy kind of areas. So part of it is just the logistics of genocide and the way that violence um, was perpetrated uh, has had very real political impacts in Rwanda. So uh, Rwanda has been um, both that and the way that the uh, RPF, um, the now ruling party, they were the army at the time that came in from Uganda. Uh, they had a lot of um, women combatants with them um, doing this. And so from very early on, Rwanda was very interested in um, issues of gender-based violence, of uh, women veterans, um, of women's involvement in the political process as part of the vision of the liberation of the country. So the liberation of the country is very tied to gender liberation well, you as know, well. Which, in is, which is excellent because I know in Namibia, I found out from some Namibians that they have a higher percentage of women through their constitution have to be in their system. Whereas in Botswana, it's just the opposite. It's like the chauvinistic, patriarchal, misogynistic kind of negativity where women are back in the corner and then they have hopeless where women are not invited. And if they're invited, they got to wear a pair of pants. It's just some stupid, asinine, backward mentality stuff. And then you wonder yeah. why some of these countries don't advance because they don't deal with uh, female equality and again, stop dealing with women in a very pejorative, negative way. 
And then well, also, do you think, oh, I'll, I'll add on to the, the other reason why gender ends up being so important in Rwanda is um, a lot of these organizations that are doing the work on the ground that are actually helping people live their everyday lives. And that's why, you know, went with that everyday justice idea. Um, it's not, it's not necessarily, you know, there's a role um, and it's important that you have these legal precedents from the International Criminal Tribunal. It's important that people have been able to talk at their gachachas. Um, but a lot of times what gets people to even be able to testify in the first place is the work of these organizations. And a disproportionate number of them tend to be run by women or be women's organizations. Um, and that uh, that kind of started, uh, a lot of people will talk about um, Beijing 1995 as this kind of, you know, hallmark of, of international women's rights, but they, they forget about the third world conference on women, which was in Nairobi, Kenya. Um, and that built a lot of, upon a great deal of women's organizations that were active on the continent and that remained active. So some of these organizations had existed prior to genocide and they were able to kind of reframe and um, the same way that Gachacha was reframed to um, help, the way the same way that Gachacha was able to be reframed to deal with um, crimes of genocide, these organizations said, "Hey, we're we were already working on development, and this is what people need after this mass violence is a way to continue their lives. So we can do that work." And it and um, people forget that important role of women's organizations in. Yeah, on the African continent, because it tends to get overshadowed with the, um, you know, Beijing, Hillary Clinton, um, women's rights or people's rights or, or human rights. Uh, so that's that's part of why you can't really talk Rwanda without talking the gender aspect because of how active these organizations, um, these women's organizations have been um, and how central it's been to the experience of genocide and also the politics since genocide. Well, we can't ignore gender in general. I mean, that's like ignoring race, and we do that sometimes in our chauvinistic environments and so on. Mm -hmm. I want to switch up because there was a term you kept referring to in your paper called African populism. Explain mm -hmm. what that means. I, I'm not sure, but again, what, what are we talking here? Yeah, well, and it's especially uh, uh, if you think a lot of a lot of the terms of populism today gets us thinking to like MAGA, uh, to the, you know, um, current Hungarian president, that kind of thing. Um, so populist connotations uh, tend to be in Western media quite negative. Um, how, how populism manifests on the African continent tends to be a lot more um, very, very connected with the both uh, independence movements, but also that emphasis on the the importance of uh, pre-colonial traditions, right? The, the understanding that there was a whole, there was a whole political system, right? Um, and Africans built great wealth for themselves long before colonialism. This is why people wanted to come, you know, to the continent for the resources and all of that. Um, and so what African populism often does is emphasize uh, almost what you would call more like self-determination. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, we're okay. in Omaha, we're kind of in, in the home of, of um, Al-Haj Malik Al-Shabazz. And so, uh, you know, that idea of a community building itself without having um, to be controlled by external factors. Which, which um, is so key when we're talking about indigenous cultures, Native Americans, whoever, and we're trying to be sacred to those respective groups. Now, one of the things in your paper, I found it was good to read your explanation of the economy of de democratization and economic development from a Western perspective as people-centered. Again, some people don't know that. Can you explain mm -hmm. Western economic versus people-centered development in African Nation? And would you say most of the aid that came from the Rwanda or elsewhere, and even in South Africa, whatever, serves U.S. interests? Mm -hmm. Oh, well, and that, so that ends up, uh, so this is, this is very much from um, uh, uh, mainly Makik, uh, uh, Makikigile and also um, Ake uh, talking about this idea that uh, best way to explain it is you have an organization that's doing work, right? And I'd run into organizations, um, actually, especially in Bosnia doing this, but um, they'd, they'd be doing their work 
and then donor interests would switch. So they talked about this switch of donor interest from like gender issues to environmental issues. And so they now had to pivot their language to be able to get the same kind of funding to keep running. Gotcha. Um, and so it wasn't kind of this, the organization says, hey, here's this cool thing we're doing. Um, and here's how you can be a part of this and be a partner with us and and let us take the lead, but but you know, work with us. Instead, it becomes this, we have the answer for you. And so we will, you know, we will give you these this aid, but you really have to do this, this, this. I mean, there's a it's kind of like an anecdotal saying type of thing. Um, and it doesn't, it doesn't it's it's more, it's a little bit more north, but it's so it's not a Rwandan saying at all. But uh, this narrative of, you know, these folks come in and they're like, hey, there's all this flat land, you should, by, right by the river, you should plant your crops there. Mm -hmm. And so folks go, okay, fine, we'll plant the crops there. And then uh, by the time they're about ready to grow, the hippos come out of the river and eat everything. And the locals <laughs> say, yeah, that's why we don't plant any crops there, because the hippos <laughs> will eat it, right? Like, and so, like, the importance of the local knowledge Um and that's what that idea of people center, like what do the folks on the ground doing the work, let them be in charge of it, as opposed to this idea of like, oh, X people need development help and only we can give it to them. So it's kind of that white, white savior development versus. Right. That, that, you know, I like the, the way you explain because it, it reminds me of Botswana where they're fighting now where Germany and Britain are against importing tusks and ivory. And they said, no, we got too many elephants here and they want to save the lives of all these elephants, but the elephants are eating all the food and destroying people's crops and there's just too many of them. And it's like, unless you're in that country helping them to deal with their indigenous folks that survive, you can't tell them what to do with the animals there. You want all the animals, as the president of Botswana said, we'll send you 20,000 elephants to Germany and let you deal with them. How would you handle elephants running around the city? I'm going to switch up a bit. And I think this is something a little bit different here. You actually were in Rwanda and doing your research. What was it like talking directly to Rwanda people about sensitive issues like that? I'm a little uh, concerned and wanting to know how what was that like for you? Yeah. Oh, well, and there is, because um, even uh, gender played an important role in that as well, because uh, uh, like whether the, the type of things you could talk about changes based on your marital status. Um, for example. Wait, 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 hold um, on. So married people talk different than single women and men? Is that what you're saying? Um, well, there's certain, there's this idea that there's certain discussions that uh, you don't want to go into too, into too much detail with if you are dealing with an unmarried woman. So if you're talking to an unmarried researcher type of thing oh, okay. versus marriage. Gotcha. Right. Um, because wow. you're not fully a woman. And even so, I was in this interesting <laughs> in-between area because I was married but I didn't have kids yet. So you don't become a full woman until you have the kids. Right, right I understand that. So I, understand so I was that. kind of in that. Um, I, no, I understand. I've been, I was on the count of a couple of years. So. It's like you treat it yeah. sometimes as an adolescent until you move to certain stages and also certain ages. So there's a whole hierarchy of how you interact, gender, marriage, children, and so on. And when you yes. arrive, when you have children and you're married. Gotcha. Yeah, because then you understand kind of the reality is you understand more of life gotcha. once you've done that. So, um, but also you have, you know, clearly, clearly the uh, right. What's what's the saying? Um, beware the white woman and her note and her notebook. Right? right. Like you have a lot of folks um, and especially in Rwanda, a lot of people uh, research gender in Rwanda because of the the many initiatives the government has done, the high amount of women in government, um, the higher amount of women in minister positions, um, in key advising roles. Uh, so you tend to, to have people experience a lot of research fatigue, right? Um, so use, use the word so, research fatigue. Are you talking about research fatigue on the on the level of the academicians? Or no, the no, no, no. I'm talking about the people. people oh, the yeah, people like there. The, okay, got you. People there, like they have, they have so many researchers coming through. Okay, right. got you. Oversaturation, um, got you. And so that they they can feel, um, they can feel very it can feel very transactional, right? Like right. somebody comes through, they do their research, they take their research off, um, and so uh, it was one of the things you know they often don't get to see it back. So um, one of the things that that uh, you know part of the a lot of a lot of these perspectives come from what I talked about in the article is a combination of. Um, 
so care ethics and African populism all kind of focuses on people, right? Mm -hmm. like, what do people need? What do whole people need? Um, and that was one of the, my interests in coming to Creighton because that idea of whole person, cure personalis. Um, so, uh, you know, what's missing, what I, what I was looking for is what was missing in the transitional justice literature. And that is what do whole people actually need after something like this? And it's not just trials, it's a whole range right. of things, um, including being, you know, the, the folks who get to decide what they need. Right. Um, but uh, what, what it means is you, you basically talk directly to the people. And you oh, yes. yes that. Oh, yeah. That, that's how, how it was. So one of the things that I wanted to make sure that I did, um, especially knowing and hearing from people this fear that, you know, they'll be talked to and they won't get to see the outcome of it, is I made sure that I had research presentations in country um, before I left at kind of multiple sites so that, you know, because there had been a lot of complaints that this research would get taken out of the community and not um, be never heard back, from it. It would be brought back in. And that, matter of fact, we have the same problem in North and South Omaha. You got these fly by yes. night flights, save your personality mm -hmm. from city government, county government. They come and do the study, do whatever. And you never hear the planning department come back with a final plan. Or you got these functionaries in the criminal justice system the juvenile justice system, they have strategic plans, it's supposed to include us, but you never see the finished product. And then once they get going, they implement them in an arbitrary, capricious, negative way, and it doesn't have that community buy-in and so on. We're, we're kind of looking at time a little bit, but I'm gonna ask you, I'm gonna switch over to, I didn't know that Creighton had an African department study or studies and black program, black studies program. What is their contributions to both Creighton and the community? Because this is new to me. Yeah, well, and so um, they're both small, there's both small programs, so they're minors. Um, and so uh, you have African studies and you have um, African American and Black diasporic studies. Um, oh, wait, wait, did you say so, Black guy sport or Black sports? What do you say there? Oh, Black diasporic studies. Oh, di okay, di okay. I thought you said Black guy sports. <laughs> no, 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 that, uh, uh, so um, they, they end up being a place where students get kind of whole world understanding, right? Mm -hmm. um, and especially highlighting, I mean, if you think about the Institute for Latin American Concern or ILAC on campus, uh, it's a partner organization that Creighton has been working with for 50 years in the Dominican Republic. And they, right. you know, students and nursing students and doctoral students, all kinds of students go, even our Global Scholars Program, um, where students, uh, they come in as global scholars. Uh, they spend their first semester at Creighton, actually, at an international university. And then um, they have to spend another semester uh, in the Dominican Republic. And then um, their junior year summer, they have to be interning internationally. Um, so they have a lot of these connections with ILAC. Uh, but um, if somebody is doing really cursory approaches, they might just make assumptions about the populations of Caribbean nations, of uh, South American nations, and not realize how many, how much of the population is Black diasporic populations, right? Um, and so uh, it really kind of helps students understand that. I mean, when you're going to Dominican Republic, 73% of the population is, is uh, Black Dominican Republic. Um, and so uh, kind of getting to understand how race justice um, works being a campus that is situated, I say in North Omaha, um, but I'm new enough that maybe maybe I am not, quite, but I mean, coming street is right there. Um, and an I know an other island, parts of town. Those it's an island in North Omaha, but has lots of tall walls around it that doesn't interact with North Omaha on the level yeah. it should. And again, it's so different in Georgetown yeah. and a lot of other universities in our country that are close to the center of the city. But Georgetown, I think, may be a little bit different. But again, you would think they would have a greater relationship and they have not historically had that. Yeah. Well, in George, Georgetown is interesting because they created their, like they, if you look at their um, their Black Studies program, they created it specifically um, to deal with the injustices right. that have been Reparations, done. They're, they're, they're probably the best in the country. I had yeah. a chance to visit there and I was just um, blown away when I came back and I shared it with some of the people mm -hmm. here 
and there was not any cognitive development or process to follow up on that template because you really don't have to do a lot because Georgetown is like on the cutting edge of even helping the former uh, descendants of enslaved folks and even mm -hmm. the terminology. And I had, like I said, it's beautiful, powerful stuff. Yeah. I'm gonna switch up and ask you if I can. You argue about the importance of the victims are disaffected in the center of discussion throughout. Okay, and mm -hmm. as you said and then done. How does one establish a platform or paradigm or process both in the continent of the United States that is victim centered in a positive way or constructive way versus that other stuff? Yeah. Well, and I mean, and this is um, and not necessarily uh maybe community even just community centered, right? Is it a way to think about connecting these two? Um, because uh, you know, there are clear things that th that the uh, African American Black Diasporic Studies, African Studies program does curricularly on campus and for programming and for Creighton students um, and getting, you know, trying to get them out into the community more. But there's not, I mean, you've noticed that there's not as much uh, community uh, right. connection opportunity. Interaction, right, right. You know, um, and so, uh, you know, part of the reason I was interested in doing this is starting to look at what does that look like? I mean, there's been, there's been certain groups have been better. So like the Highlander has, um, health professions out there. Right. Uh, 30th and uh, yeah, Patrick those, area, right. Yeah, and some of those um, wellness programs, that kind of stuff. Um, but it's the same, it's actually a similar kind of motivation. Like what do, what do people in a community actually want from research that is going on around them, about them? Like, let's make it with, right? Um, and so with the uh, uh, part of, part of what a lot of the the participants wanted was kind of an understand people have an understanding that they are the experts on themselves right right, right. They know and themselves so right. to like talk with them first i mean it sounds really really simple and and like duh but but that is like it is the simplest it is the simplest thing but it's the hardest thing because once you have donors right you want to control the stipulations you want to you know even if, right. if you've ever done a grant grant proposal like you're matching yourself to the organization doing the grant um i mean and it's part of the reason if you're noticing why you get such an increase in um chinese uh companies going going in is there's there's generally a hey you need x thing sure we'll let you do this we'll let you take the lead they do tend to have you know make demands for a certain percentage of their own workers and that creates some local local right. tension but um there's more opportunity for autonomy and so folks folks go with that um as opposed to kind of strings attached and so really a lot of it is about kind of checking checking academicians and development folks making sure you over there please i know i know dear <laughs> checking um so i'll do that sentence over again if you need to edit that out so a lot of the a lot of what's necessary is um kind of academician donor humility right understanding that this is a process of learning from learning with not a I'm the expert, so I have the answer. Right, right. right. Um, uh, I mean, there's a really good, this is a South African uh, book, but there's a book called um, Walk With Us and Listen, and it really kind of encapsulates that idea of, yes, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. Yes, there is, um, the, the government of Rwanda is doing solidly economically, but it's focused on kind of infrastructure, um, you know, so not doing kind of individual Right. restitution movements um uh and it's in it's been focused on reincorporating uh everybody into a rwandan community um even even so far as uh you know they were having this problem with the prisons in the 90s because they had so many people in prison that like sometimes it'd be standing room only like people were losing limbs because of infections, that kind of stuff. Wow. Wow. And the, the Rwandan government was ultimately like, you know what? Um, yes, we have these perpetrators we're super, we're super concerned about, we're super upset with, but uh, it costs us as a country more to have these people in, in prison than if they were out and working and building the Rwandan economy. So let's figure out a way 
to, you know, we, we share some of the common. The United States is the same way. We got more people in prison. Yes. And especially some of the asinine judges who give them long sentence for things, sometimes they're victimless crimes. Again, I'm not saying mm -hmm. you're going to support criminals on some behaviors, but again, what's the difference between 10 years or five years or something, maybe embezzlement, you know, or whatever. We're, we're yeah. well, and the, and understanding, under, understanding that understanding that. That's, I mean, the the very even the very individualistic focus on you know I'm gonna I'm gonna punish this individual person like what is a community missing out on right? right like so what's the difference between the five years of work of family life of other sorts of things that could have been going on that that's the kind of questions um, and sometimes it's put the Rwandan government in um, uh, it's displeased survivor organizations you know. Um, some of the things uh, because survivor organizations noted, hey, you won this as a outright military victory. You can kind of do what you want, right? Like, right, but, but uh, also we got to consider just, like, restorative justice in a sense because some of the stuff is just mm -hmm. taking people's lives. And again, we're talking about in mm -hmm. this country, there's a disproportionate number of African Americans in prison, which caused the destruction of the black family. Not to say that, again, we got to look at all these issues, but we got to bring more community into it instead of have a bunch of airbrained people in the judicial system that don't understand the climate of that area or the community and how we need to deal with sort of I want to ask you a question. There's, a, there's an issue between balancing exists between the perpetrators and the victim survival in society. How did that healing occur? And is there still a level of pain in the victims or guilt of the perpetrators? In other words, when you were there, a lot of this stuff was going on. And those of us who are outside are going to ask the question, was there really healing? Was there really reconciliation? Was there that? Or was it that case where we just go through the motions and we just cover up the cancer with a Band-Aid? Yeah. Well, and there's, so the best, so there's this woman I was talking to, and she, she said it in a way that echoed in many others, but she said it wonderfully. Um, because she pointed these, we were in this um, memorial center, and so, you know, she pointed these newer coffins because, uh, the, their family's perpetrator had finally told them where the bodies were, mm -hmm. and so they were able to to bury them. And she said, uh, "You know, um, you ask you ask what justice after genocide is. It's this. It's we live together. Um, you know, every year we ask, um, and I'm not I'm paraphrasing, but every year at commemoration we ask where the bodies are. Every year they don't tell us, and yet we live together." Um, we know that they can't kill us. They know that we can't take revenge, and so we live together. Um, so it's not really a super romantic, romanticized sort of thing, but it is a really practical. Um, you know, a lot of these you see a lot of um, even perpetrator survivor uh, cooperative, like economic cooperatives, where they're working the same fields, doing the same market stuff. Um, and so, you know, it's not always that you know they're trying to have dinner together every night. But just the fact of being able to live together in a community, undergoing economic processes, undergoing schooling for their kids. Um, part of part of me, and that's kind of why I went with that everyday justice, like just the, the, the daily living together, um, trying to trying to notice that itself is quite remarkable mm. right and quite hope filled um, you know, i want i want to do a change a of, of, i want to do a change of if i can and throw this out we talked about the hootsi and the tootsies and again you being a person who came in from the outside if somebody was from the outside, how would you distinguish between the two of them? The reason I ask that, if you're in Southern Africa, sometimes it's hard to distinguish between the different Tosa, Zulu, mm -hmm. Haiti, Sano speaking, Swan, Sutu, you name it, because they've intermarried or they got groups and so on. Again, you can tell mm -hmm. the difference between uh, Nguni here or there, but could you actually physically see a difference or was the language? How would you know who was who? No, I mean, even even during, the yeah, even during the genocide, you couldn't tell um, Hutu and Tutsi. Uh, a lot of times, so, so there were there, you know, there were like some stereotypical features, okay. but there've been so much um, intermarrying. That's that, what I was wondering. Okay, yeah. you tell, um, that's what I was wondering. I mean, Many of these countries you can't tell, but people talk about it as if it's a finite situation. And again, we yeah. know how people evolve over the years of transition. And again, as people start to get much more into balancing integration, things happen differently. So that's that. Uh, one of the things I was going to come to, and I think as I read your paper, and I'm really into this. 
I thought that about the impact of enslavement of millions of Africans in the United States. We don't give justice to it, particularly the historical trauma uh, that had been played mm -hmm. out in that current society. Some cannot see that link. Did that resonate you with you in your research? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, so when I say that I do care ethics, I the broad bit of my research care ethics and ethnicized racialized violence. Um, I end up seeing a lot of connections in that. Um, from the US, Rwanda is often described as, as an ethnic conflict, ethnic genocide, um, but it's understood locally as racialized, right. um, like different races, right? But um, within the US, uh, uh, our definitions of race are very different, right? right? Um, and so, I mean, this is why this is partially why in the genocide you'd you'd have somebody's purposely thrown in this one specific river because the thought is it would go back up uh, and connect with the Nile where this race of people were originally from. Right. Um, but they they so couldn't tell that you had they had to still use the ID cards because the ID cards would say like their ethnicity on it. Mm -hmm. um, so at these checkpoints, they would look at the ID card to see if you were Tutsi or Hutu um, type of thing. And uh, you know, one of the folks that I talked to with, um, we went to recover, reco recover our bodies, um, and uh, like his father's wallet was still in his pocket, and it had his, you know, his check mark as Tutsi um, type of thing. But when you're thinking of how these sorts of things speak to the to the U.S. experience of racialized violence, um, I mean some of the things you're talking about are the same challenges, right? Like within Rwanda, you have, uh, you know, you'll have donors focusing on um, certain aspects, right? Um, and not being kind of driven by the people on the ground or the organizations that are already existing on the ground, right? Um, and you mentioned the challenges within um, Omaha of people doing research for the community, but then never hearing what comes right. out of it. Right. Um, and you see some communities in the U.S., uh, like Greens, I, I'm sure you've seen the Greensboro Truth, uh, Truth Commission. Right. Uh, so they had a they had some um, uh, people killed there and they went through kind of a community truth commission to try to figure, you know, at least get a agreed upon narrative, because as a country, we don't have a, an agreed upon narrative of the Civil War, you know, <laughs> um, and uh we often do this really quick discussion of civil war happened and then Jim Crow and we forget about reconstruction because reconstruction has these stories of, you know, majority black legislature in South Carolina right. um, and a lot of black political empowerment, black political leaders, and that just disappears. And then you have these discussions of, well, you know, in civil rights era, people, people were learning how to get involved for the first time. And it's like, no, no. There was actually, you know, I mean, the U.S. government created Penn Center in South Carolina to to be a, you know, during the Civil War, a um, effort in community-led, Black community-led democracy, right? Um, like, there are models for how to do this. This was done during Reconstruction, um, but uh, we got rid of that that history. <laughs> Well, right. part of it is that our institutions don't do a good job of distinct de deconstructing or distilling or drilling down to that. And again, you get, you almost have to be in a graduate school to understand that because we kind of gloss over it, just like mm -hmm. Nebraska history. A lot of people come here, they have no clue about the culture here unless mm -hmm. they teach it on a different level. But they, again, the thought is that the institution kind of glows, you know, glosses over it in such a way. Now, one thing, I mean, we're getting to the end. You cited... Um, some excellent source material in your paper. I noticed some of your research and also your citations. And But when I read your conclusion, I cannot determine if there was closure to your research. What did you take away from your experience of being in Rwanda and so on? Um, ex exactly that, that idea of prioritize the whole people who are, who are, who are there, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, the importance of uh, coming in and thinking about partnerships and not saviors. Mm -hmm. um, and also the idea of being okay with messy recon uh, reconciliation, right? That uh, uh, sometimes 
folks are going to want their own space. Um, uh, you know, folks are going to run their own, run their own path. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, being willing to walk with rather than, you know, fix something because that ends up being the goal in so many of these things. I'm going to, I'm going to fix. And if I can't get a quick fix, then uh, I'm just going to throw in the towel and move on to the next project, as opposed to understanding this is a process. It's an everyday lived thing. Um, and so this idea of justice uh, may not have an end in one or two or three lifetimes, right? Like it may be a perpetual um, perpetual thing. And once you have violence like this, right? Once you have um, genocide in Rwanda, once you have enslavement of people, once you have lynchings of people, um, this doesn't just quickly heal and move on. It it's it's kind of a uh, uh, so there's this there's this great um it's it stays on my computer but it's it's connected with the outcome of my research right this idea um it came out, it came out later but that idea of being okay with messy everyday justice and prioritizing people and whatever it is that people need he has this idea that uh, you know goodness together with love justice and solidarity are not achieved once and for all they have to be realized each day. Right. And so the same kind of thing, like justice is every day. Um, it's not the trial has ended and so everything's OK. Or, um, you know, the Truth Commission has ended, has done its report, so everything's OK. Um, it's an everyday lived thing that's just going to be much messier than we like. So if you read a lot of the, the literature on, on Rwanda, um, it tends to focus either on challenges with the government, um, uh, questions of um, free speech, that kind of stuff, or it goes to these overly romanticized stories of, and you do have perpetrators and survivors who, you know, have meals together every day, who do all of that, but that's not everybody. Um, and so, uh, you know, if you're if you're interested in this with human rights work, there's this great book by this guy called Meister called After Evil, and how we we tend to want like perfect victims. And when we don't have that, or when we don't have perfect reconciliation, um, we throw in the towel or we say there's something failed with the process as opposed, you know, and we need to put our funding elsewhere as opposed to understanding that every day this has to happen. And some days are going to be easier. Some days are going to be harder. Um, and that it's, it's a series, it's a period of accompaniment. Gotcha. So there, there isn't, there isn't an end gotcha. because there shouldn't. Got you. I understand. We're at the yeah. last point and always like to give our guests a chance. Any closing comment you'd like to listen to, uh, share with our viewing or listening audience, Dr. Roos? Yeah, well, one of the things um, that I always think about is uh, how much these kind of experiences help help within our own communities, right? Like it help in terms of thinking, okay, so we have these different models. Like what can we learn from Rwanda. If I'm living wherever I'm living, what can I learn from Rwanda instead of, you know, thinking of thinking of Rwanda as a site where knowledge is deposited? Like, no, it's a site where we should all get information from and think, okay, um, is there something that is gachacha like in my community that would be similar? Uh, and now they have. They, so there's the international criminal court level, there's the gachacha level, but they also have their regular criminal justice system. So some trials go through the regular court system. Um, so, uh, you know, what are the lessons that I'm getting from there? What can I take from other people? What, how can I figure out what works for me um, and how I can live in my community with whatever justice needs to look like in my community? Yeah. Well, I tell you, appreciate you being here today and hope we get a chance to get a chance to do this again. And we hope that people have enjoyed this program. Join us again for another edition of Throwing Out Some Heavy Light, Barocco.